he loved watching tennis, he loved watching Becker, he loved watching Sampras and when he went on court he actually wanted to do the same. He's a perfect player, perfect serve, perfect volley, super perfect forehand, perfect backhand, very fast on court, everything is, is perfect. I think it's a God-given talent. I mean, he really has uh, handled it great, being number one in the world for many years, and I don't see anyone really stopping him. I mean, if he's going to continue uh, what he's been doing for the last three, four years now, he's going to be the greatest player who ever played the game. When people watch Roger Federer, the Swiss master has dominated the game for over four years with style, grace, and brilliance. greatest ambassador, a global icon, a campaigner for humanitarian work, even a fashion icon. Roger Federer's journey from talented junior in Switzerland to the pinnacle of the game has made him one of the most recognizable and admired sporting superstars in the world. For me, it's uh, an absolute dream come true. It's almost disbelief still to some degree. But I know in what kind of an atmosphere I know. It's different. People see me in a different way. Now when they see me play, they have the feeling they see history at work, you know. It's, it's, it's different now than, than before. It's time to definitely change now. I was very active, you know, almost hyperactive to a point, you know. My parents always had to calm me down. I would play against the cupboards back at home, against the garage door. It just boom, 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 boom. He played them for hours up to the walls. And, uh, you could just see the endurance he had and uh, uh, how much he enjoyed just doing something with a, with a ball, any kind of a ball. He played soccer, he had a rugby ball, he played table tennis. He hardly could look over the, the table tennis play. And and gradually, when we spend some time at the tennis club, everybody said, I think this is unbelievable. He said, oh, you know, he just hits the ball so well already at his age. Never realized that he had such a talent to, to become a tennis player. We didn't quite believe it till he proved himself on court. Robert and Lynette Federer's modesty may have stopped them from regarding their son as a champion from the very beginning. But at the age of eight, there was no doubting his talent. Roger was enrolled at Old Boys Tennis Club in Federer's hometown of Basel, in the German-speaking region of Switzerland. I practiced there three times a week, you know. I had sometimes group trainings, you know, which was fun, you know, with other guys. Then I had also private lessons, you know, for 45 minutes a, a day sometimes. So that was, that was very good. He was always a very good junior. I mean, in Switzerland, he was one of the best, or the best one at his age, in his age. But he was a little bit like an artist. He was playing a lot. He was maybe not so concentrated. At Old Boys, Roger honed his craft under the tutelage of a young Australian coach, Peter Carter. Roger was very fond of Peter, so they loved traveling together. Uh, they used to have fun together. They used to practice together. It was a marvelous time, and Peter was a very important person in Roger's life. Roger's progress was rapid. At 11, he won his first Swiss national title. Two years later, he was good enough to play international competitions. At this point, Roger made the biggest decision of his life. He would leave home in order to fulfill his dream of becoming a professional player. Ecublon, in the outskirts of Lausanne, was the location for the Swiss National Tennis Center, where the country's elite-level junior players received coaching. For a 14-year-old leaving home, Ecublon was a world away from Basel, emotionally and culturally. 
was going to be very hard for me. I knew that from the start, but I never thought it was going to be that hard like the first three to six months where I was crying a lot. I was away from home, you know, taking the train back and forth Fridays and Sundays was, was really difficult for me. And uh, thank God I really had a nice family and a nice uh, team also in Ecuador who took care of me. He was very sad because, first of all, it was a language barrier. He didn't, he didn't understand. Uh, he had to go to a French-speaking school and he didn't understand anything. And uh, the practice was very tough. He wasn't a very strong boy at that age. So he was exhausted. Okay, it was half an experience, but Rachel never himself wanted to break it up. He never said, actually, Papi, I want to come home. Uh, uh, I, I'm so homesick, I can't live down there. This was already the, the sign that for tennis I would do everything. Federer was soon able to conquer his homesickness, but it took a little longer to control his emotions. He was throwing rackets around and stamping on the court and getting horribly annoyed if he was losing or the game didn't go his way. Oh yeah, he was going, he was going nuts on the court. Uh, if you look at him now, you, can, you can't believe it. We were never angry at Roger if he lost a match, but we were really always angry at him because of his behavior. I mean, I was very bad when I was younger, to be honest, you know, I always had a tough time being consistently um, strong mentally. I would always have these lapses, you know, where I would get very disappointed, very angry, very sad. I would go through an emotional roller coaster all the time, and this is also, I think, what the other players always expected me to do, you know. They would say, if you stay on top of Roger, eventually he will let go, or we will have these ten minutes where he won't be able to control himself. Roger spent at the National Tennis Center saw rapid development as he became one of the top juniors in the game. At 16, he made his first ever visit to a venue that would come to define him as a tennis player. Making it to Wimbledon for me in juniors was like, finally, you know, I've made it. Anything that comes now is a big bonus. I was so nervous in the first round that I couldn't play. I asked the umpire if he could check the net if it wasn't too high. I felt like the high was like a, a volleyball net, you know. So he went to check. He said, "Of course, no, no, everything is fine." And so I was like, "Of course it's fine. You know, it's Wimbledon. They, they wouldn't make a mistake like this." So it was funny things like this, you know, that happened to me in Wimbledon because it meant so much to me. At the same tournament that Pete Sampras celebrated his fifth senior title, Roger followed in the footsteps of Bjorn Borg and Stefan Edler by becoming Wimbledon junior champion. It was his greatest triumph so far. I remember one thing I still regret a little bit today is I was invited to go to the dinner that night, to the champions' dinner. And I didn't go because I wanted to get ready for my first round in Gestalt where I got my first wildcard ever into a tour event. People might say, yeah, you're right to do that. At the same time, you never know if ever you're going to be at the Champions Dinner ever again. As the world's number one junior, Roger had an obvious career choice to make. At the age of 17, he turned professional. It's a bit scary, to be honest, in the beginning, you know, you look at it and you go like, these guys have beards, you know, they're big and strong and they're 15 years older than me. God, they have experience, how am I going to do this, you know? He still had too much respect for people. I, I got along well with him. But he sort of respected me too much and, and he gave me far too much credit. You know, he just had to develop, he had to get the experience and the tour. He had to become tougher mentally. And that happened over those couple of years, he became better and better.